Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is Harold Garfinkel, video two. In this video, I've got three goals. In the first, I want to show you how Garfinkel is moving away from structural functionalism. Next, I want to look to three ethnomethodological studies. Finally, I'll get you ready to do your two-paragraph response. Let's do it. The readings show the difference between Parsons and Garfinkel, looking at status degradation versus functional deviance. In this week's readings, you'll note that Garfinkel is somewhat similar to Parsons, but also doing something quite different. They are both addressing structural conditions, yes. They are also both focusing on morals, like Durkheim, but they do so in very different ways. First and foremost is the question of scale. Though the piece reads very abstractly, Garfinkel is arguing that the moral work done to reduce one's status is done in very particular and immediate conditions. This is very different than Parsons' scope, which applies the same analysis in an individual organism to the social order as a whole. For Parsons, the moral order exists at the border between agency and structure, how roles and collectives determine the action that allows them to continue. Action is by definition moral insofar as it takes place in a cultural climate, expresses choice so long as choices exist, and is corrected should it challenge the structure in which it takes place, if that structure is to persist. Morality is a question of structural reproduction, of social action. For Garfinkel, morality is an outcome of systems of accountability, and ultimately is a question of reality. Though the scope is much smaller, the definition of morality becomes much wider. Jurors and judges decide what really happened in coming up with an account of action. It is productive of a new social order and completely constitutes those subject to it, as in the case of status degradation, as you see on the slide. Again, this extends the space of morality. It doesn't just shape action, as in the case of preferences or attitudes. It defines the entire social occasion. It doesn't just reinforce social roles, it makes them. I'll leave it to your criminology professors to discuss the piece as an accurate portrayal of punishment in modern society. What matters for us is that it shows the differences between the work of Garfinkel and Parsons. In the remainder of the examples, we'll see the gulf between these two kinds of projects, the ethnomethodological and the structural functionalist, widen significantly. Next, we turn to Chapter 5 in Studies in Ethnomethodology the case of Agnes. Like those contained in Goffman's Asylums, I think it is probably one of the finest essays a sociologist has ever written. Working with a team of a psychiatrist and a psychologist, Garfinkel did a series of interviews with a woman, given the pseudonym Agnes, who was born and assigned as male up to age 17 and who had come to Los Angeles to undergo a sex transition. Participating in the study was part of what allowed Agnes to afford the surgery. What Garfinkel does is use the case of Agnes as a practical methodologist to show that both gender and sex are themselves moral outcomes of everyday interaction. What the research team did was discuss with Agnes the various ways that she navigated the moral sexual order, given that she was always aiming to achieve the status of normal, natural female at all times. Agnes would discuss how she'd navigate social settings that would present the opportunity for detection, like avoiding trips to go to the beach or not driving a car for fear that in the case of a collision, she might be discovered as something other than an always and forever woman, not someone who had undergone surgery. She had a boyfriend and would discuss the various ways she avoided intimate contact until after her surgery would be completed. Garfinkel suggests, using this example, that there are particular rules to the game that we adopt to perform gender, but these are always in flux. The game is constantly changing and pre-established rules don't help much. In Agnes's case, she was making up new rules as she went along, while also gaining new information about people through the ways that they performed gender and sex. In this way, Garfinkel reads Agnes as a practical methodologist who treats others as cultural events. In English, Garfinkel and his team argue that both sex and gender ultimately reside in the moral order 
before they are applied to people. Just like Husserl is arguing that scientific entities are themselves the product of the life world, Garfinkel and colleagues argue that gender and sex are performed there as well. In this sense, sex and gender are collective, rather than individual, possessions. Now, I keep saying gender and sex for an important reason. It isn't only that we come up with particular forms of gender that are applied to a more fundamental biological sex. This we call the sex-gender dichotomy. Garfinkel is making a much stronger claim about the nature of sex. He is arguing that even biological sex is organized in the spaces of collective action. In this sense, the chapter is a predecessor to the kind of work that Judith Butler has done. At the start of the study, Agnes had identified herself as intersex. The clinicians have asked her if she had used hormones to cause this to happen, but she had denied this repeatedly, and in order to undergo the transition, she would have to be extremely careful about the dosage of drugs. However, once the surgeries had been performed, Agnes indicated this wasn't true. She had, in fact, simply been born male and had taken her mother's hormones prescribed for another reason. She then used her mother's prescription to undergo her own transition on the side. Garfinkel and his colleagues only realized this after the fact. Not only did Agnes treat sex categories as culturally organized, she showed how the people running the study themselves used culturally organized categories as a backdrop for practical action. In saying that sex and gender are moral categories, Garfinkel is not telling us what they should be. He is simply stating that they are performed. Even though they are performed, they are real. Next, we turn to a clever little piece by Joan Emerson. Emerson's Nothing Unusual is Happening gives us a plain English accompaniment to Garfinkel's studies. Emerson doesn't use the terms accountability or write like Garfinkel does, thankfully, but she presents a very similar argument about the ways that there is a shared frame of reference in the attitude of nothing unusual is happening that we produce in routine, socially situated action. She presents two examples to make her case, both of which I find quite instructive. Like Garfinkel, Emerson is arguing there is a shared moral space that we are all constantly performing in our commonplace interactions. First, the case of the gynecological exam. There's a lot of mundane work that goes into maintaining a serious, professional medical procedure, and both parties, doctor and patient, perpetuate it. Again, the commonality with the image of spinning plates should be apparent. Emerson argues that in order for medical practice to continue, we must frame the actions taking place on behalf of both patient or practitioner in terms of a medical definition of reality. People are to be professional, serious. Even if there's a movement away from this definition, for example, a breach of professional conduct, it will be a move away from the default professional and serious conduct that should have happened. Her second, more light-hearted example is an attempted robbery at a costume party. In the newspaper story, the robbers couldn't pull off their crime because nobody believed they were seriously robbing them and resisted the definition of the situation. In both cases, those of the gynecological exam or the case of a party and a holdup that just didn't work out, participants in the situation have a prevailing attitude not reducible to individual mental states, but collective life that they use to go about their day. They, too, are practical methodologists. What Emerson is demonstrating in the piece is that deviance isn't simply a movement away from a normal kind of person, but emerges against the definition of reality, the nothing unusual is happening framework. And that if we want to explore the nature of deviance, we first have to look to how it alters or doesn't alter, that framework. Like we saw in Goffman, to locate the nature of stigmatization, we look to a shared social order before the deviation expected of persons who are performing, or fail to perform, in the moment. There are differences between Goffman's approach and this one, which we'll return to, but these are important similarities with the focus on co-presence, collective morality, routine, and normalcy. Finally, I want to look to the work of A.B. Robillard, one of Garfinkel's students. He's working in disability studies, like me. So this is selfish, but it's also going to tell us something about the nature of ethnomethodology. Robillard's piece is autoethnographic. That is, he's speaking and writing from his own first-hand experience. 
This is somewhat of a departure from Garfinkel's approach to ethnomethodology, since, as I mentioned earlier, he suggests we can't explicitly state the shared moral organization that we put to work in everyday life. The setting is this. Robillard is diagnosed with a form of muscular dystrophy, such that he does not speak, rather communicating by having his lips read. Or, in this case, by using a letter board. Robillard is in the intensive care unit for three months following a bout of pneumonia. Hence the quote above. This fieldwork is not recommended. Robillard suggests that his hospital stay shows the socially organized nature of real-time communication. Given that the interaction between him and the nurses in the hospital was always rushed, he rarely had time to form entire sentences with the letter board when his assistant wasn't present. Thus, he wasn't able to participate in communication at all, not because he can't, but because rushed moments prevented this, and the inability for all members of society to read lips. However, there were nurses with whom he became more familiar, and were more able to communicate with them. As he was at the University of Hawaii, nurses there do short, three-month stays before returning to the mainland. So he found he was able to gain interactional competence only for a short while before we'd have to start all over again. What he does is illustrate that real-time communication only unfolds against a backdrop of shared action and performance. In another example, anyone who's used Zoom on a bad internet connection knows how easily communication can fall apart. Robillard's stay in the ICU shows the limits of accountability and the collectively organized nature of ability. This is the point of disability studies. Let's see how Garfinkel stacks up against the other sociologists we've read so far in this course. In terms of Marx, Durkheim, Weber, we see a very different view of what sociology is coming from the ethno-methodologists. It is not possible, they argue, to get a bird's eye view of society, either to determine the laws that shape human behavior, to explain economic rationality, or to gain a historical account of individual rationalities. Through Garfinkel's rather strange reading of Durkheim on social facts, we cannot interpret action scientifically without changing the object itself. Marx, of course, would want nothing to do with any of this, since we're not really dealing with economic structures. He would call this all a bourgeois waste of time. Durkheim, too, since we aren't producing accounts of social structure that allow us to compare societies and the nature of social facts about them. Even though Weber, too, does interpretive sociology, we can see that Garfinkel does not think we can give a de-situated account of social action. Neither Weber nor Parsons can describe social action in a way that is not itself accountable to social order, in one form or another. All of the big three are committed to what Garfinkel called formal analysis, in that they show up to the scene with a pre-established set of categories through which to understand society. There are no formal rules to social order, says Garfinkel. This is his main break with the big three, and with Talcott Parsons. Okay, Abrams, you might say, but what about Goffman? There are a lot of similarities between the two. Goffman and Garfinkel were friends. They both worked at California universities, and both of them took the small-scale encounter as a site where social order takes place. But there are important differences. Goffman is more interested in how we maintain the appearance of order, despite the fact that everything is a disaster under the hood. He's interested in small ways that people express themselves as ordered, the different ways we carve out our own lives against larger institutions. Garfinkel, by contrast, is interested in the background order that makes social life possible at all. Social life isn't a disordered mess like it is for Goffman. Rather, there is a meaningful backdrop that is common to all potential social situations, and our job is to make that backdrop apparent even though we can't express it in a formal manner. Do we understand the difference here? Goffman's interested in small sites of push and pull in institutionalized settings, whereas Garfinkel is interested in how the whole show goes on in the first place. In this sense, the two differ on the problem of social order. That's it for me. Now it's your turn. In two paragraphs, between five to eight sentences in length, and with reference to the readings, one, explain the difference between Garfinkel's ethnomethodology and Talcott Parsons' structural functionalism. 
explain those differences using the example of jury deliberation. See you next week.